In this video, I'm going to analyze a single family house rental property so that by the end of the video, you'll be able to confidently analyze a rental for yourself. And don't worry if you're intimidated by math or spreadsheets, I'm gonna make it super easy to understand. I'm gonna draw it out. And if you stick around to the end, I'm also gonna give you a free spreadsheet that anyone can use to analyze rental properties. Let's get started. If we haven't met yet, my name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach Carson, and I've been investing in real estate for over 21 years. I also wrote the book, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor, published by Bigger Pockets. And this is a channel all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Now I'm gonna jump right in and show you a real single family house that sold not too long ago for $150,000 $400 in the small town of Central South Carolina, which is located in the upstate of South Carolina, right next to Clemson, South Carolina, where I live and invest. Now I'm going to run the numbers on this property in two different ways. The first is known as a back of the envelope analysis, which a lot of experienced investors use just to quickly tell if a deal is good or not. And you can literally write it on the back of an envelope, the back of a napkin, whatever you have to know approximately whether this deal has promise. Has it something you want to spend your time on or not? And then if that looks promising, you dig into a deeper analysis where you use a spreadsheet to prepare to make an offer and actually commit to buying the property. Now, in both cases, whether I'm doing a higher level or a more detailed analysis, I want to look at three things. You can think about these as ingredients of a good deal. Number one, I want to make sure I like the location. Number two, I want to look at the property itself, including the lot that it's sitting on. And then number three, I want to run the numbers. Does it make sense? And will I be able to make a profit on this property? And when you first get a lead, you're gonna get something like this Zillow listing here, or maybe you get an MLS listing from your real estate agent. But what I typically do, when I'm just doing this surface level, quick and dirty analysis, is just look at the property to try to see the pictures, try to look at the details of the bedrooms and baths, a description of the property maybe from the real estate agent or the person who's selling it. And I'm really just trying to quickly see, does this meet my buy box or not? If you don't know what a buy box means, I've got a link to another video I did where I went in detail on describing what my own buy box is. But in essence, you're just describing ahead of time before you go out looking for properties. This is what a good deal looks like. Here's the size of the property. Here's the location. Here's the price range of what I'm looking for. This is such an important step because if you just say, I want a good deal and I'll just take any good deal. I don't care what type of property it is, what location, that's not going to be the most effective way. You need to focus in ahead of time and that buy box eliminates a lot of other properties you don't want to look at so that you can identify when something comes across your desk like this, you can say, oh, this property is three bedrooms, two baths, a single family house, it's in a location I like. You look at the pictures just to make sure there's nothing you know, crazy wrong with it. That kind of quick analysis, you're like, okay, this looks interesting. I'm going to move on. And what I look at first, I remember the three ingredients, is I start to look at the location. And so I like to look at the Google Maps, just simply look at the Google Maps. And you can look at location in a couple different ways. I've talked a lot about this here on the channel. I like to zoom out, like literally Google Maps zoom out. And in my case, this town central is right next to Clemson. But you, you really need to do an analysis of why you are investing in this location in general. And from a higher level, a regional level, I like this metaphor of you're looking for like a sun and then planet satellites around the sun. And so the sun is where's the economic center? Where's all the energy, the gravity of why people are going to live there? People need jobs, they need income, they need a reason to live in a place. And I'll just give you a description of my own location. So Clemson, South Carolina, Central is this little town right next to it. I live in Clemson, but Greenville, South Carolina in the upstate is really the sun of, of the area. It's the economic center. It has a really nice park downtown. BMW is a big manufacturer. We have Michelin. We have a lot of tourism in the upstate. It's really become a manufacturing hub though. And so manufacturing and industry is really important in the upstate. Clemson is a kind of like a little, you could call it like a, a Mars or a, or a Jupiter or something outside of Greenville. It's, it's, it's a suburb of Greenville, 45 minutes away. It's got its own little interesting culture and gravity um, because there's a university here. And then Central, this town that I'm looking at, is kind of revolving around Clemson. It's a small four or 5,000 person town that where people is more affordable. That's a key ingredient of location. You gotta have an economic center of the sun, but the reason I go to the suburbs and look at these little planets outside of the solar system is because it's more affordable to live in some of these places than living right where the main, the main economic drivers are. And this works everywhere, by the way. This is a small little solar system, but if you go to Atlanta, Georgia, where I grew up, for example, Atlanta's the sun, and then a bunch of little suburban towns around Atlanta 
Atlanta or where you can find more affordable locations. You can do the same thing in New York, same thing in San Francisco. Everywhere has different price levels, but for small and mighty investors, which is what this channel is all about, I've really found looking at these affordable kind of satellite cities are where your best opportunities are. And so this is just a, like kind of a micro example Clemson's a satellite of Greenville, and then Central, this little town, is a sort of a satellite of Clemson, because Clemson is more expensive than Central is. So the Central might have $150,000 to $200,000 houses. Clemson averages maybe three hundred dollars to $400,000 houses. So just three miles away, and that's a big difference. So all of that to be said, jobs, demographics, price ranges is some homework you want to do ahead of time. I've done that before this lead even came across my desk. But then I want to sort of zoom in and look at the micro location. So downtown central here is where the little, it's a small little kind of main street area. And I like areas that have, there's a term called suburban uh, locations. This is a term from John Burns, who's a real estate consultant saying, you want to go to these suburban locations and find places that have a little urban feel to them. Walkability, a downtown that's got some charm to it, you know, something interesting about the place. Parks, I really like parks, I like greenways. And so those are the kinds of kind of characteristics locally that I'm looking for. And also just looking at the neighborhood itself. So this is the neighborhood where this lead came in. I happen to know it because I've owned rental properties in the neighborhood. But I, I know that it's a place that's pretty convenient to some of those things that I'm talking about in Central. Right here nearby is the Central Clemson Rec Center. You know, see how close that is to it. I happen to know there's a greenway that is going being built here in the next six to 12 months. I'm involved in the town. I know what's going on. So that would be good information to know that this house is like, you know, literally three houses away from this new greenway that's coming in. So you could walk over to the rec center and the library is right over here. And then it's pretty short walk or bike or a drive to the downtown area where there's some little restaurants and things going on. So I, as far as this town goes, this is a nice location. It's, it's this neighborhood neighborhood is safe and walkable. And so very quickly, I know I, I took a few minutes to explain all this, but within five to 10 seconds, I can know whether this location is something I'm interested in. I give it the green light, I give it the check, and then I go to the next step, which is looking at the property itself. So we like the location and that's a good start. But the next thing we want to look at is the property itself. So the house and also the lot where the house is, because we want to put ourselves in the shoes of our tenant, our customer who's going to live there. If we can find a place that's desirable for our tenant, that they want to live in for a long long period of time, it's going to make everything else easier. It's going to make the numbers that we're going to talk about next a lot easier as well. And so part of this is just, does it meet our buy box, which we already discussed, but I actually like to zoom in at the kind of Google street view level, just to ask myself some questions and, and look at the property and say, is, you know, what, what about this? Can I sell to my tenant? And there's, this is a pretty simple property. This is actually an older picture. You can see from Zillow, it was a different color. Now this was 10 years ago on the Google street view, but a lot of the tenants who are going to be living in my property are maybe moving up from an apartment. So the fact that they have their own back, they have their own yard, they're in a residential area, you know, the kids could ride their bikes in the neighborhood and there's, there's, you know, relatively safe place to be, you know, no problems here. Like that's the big deal. Uh, the location that we talked about. I also want to look at things and this is a, a checklist that I have called a desirability checklist. This is part of my deal worksheet that you can get for free if you want to look at my podcast and YouTube description, uh, get, get the, download that as well. This is a, basically a checklist. Where every time I had a problem with a rental property that I bought, I added things to the checklist. And so part of it is about the location, part of it is about the lot, part of it is about the house. So for example, when I'm looking at the lot, I want to know, is this too close to the road? Is it like a busy road and the house is really close to the road? That might be a problem for families if they're renting the, uh, the property. And then for me, from a maintenance standpoint, I look at things like, is this house above the grade of the road because of water? Water is a big issue. A lot of these things on my desirability checklist, some of them have to do with the tenant, some of them have to do with maintenance and me as a landlord. And if the, this property is actually in good shape because it's above the road, but if it were below the road, guess where water goes when it runs off and you have a big heavy rain? Well, it goes towards the house into your foundation and you have problems. Either you have to get a sump pump or you have to dig French drains. All of those are maintenance issues. You have to continually check on those things and they become problems. You can have mold, you can have issues. So I like to have low maintenance properties and this property, is a, the lot is pretty good, um, but you also just wanna check the, the surrounding areas. And this is something you'll have to do in person when you're visiting it or the person, if you're out of town, your realtor, your property manager can visit. You know, what are the neighbor's houses like? You have no control over the neighbors. You can't tell them what to do. That's their property. But if they have a couple dogs who are barking at you the entire time you're looking at the property and scaring you, or they're gonna also scare your tenants, they're gonna make it hard for them to live there. 
you can't control that. And that's something that would affect the value of your property. Or if, if in your neighborhood, if people had a bunch of junk in the yard next door, or they were playing loud music all the time, like that's kind of hard to figure out, but you need to know those things because that's going to affect your ability to rent your property. In this case, I look around the neighborhood. This is a great place to live and no problems here. Families could live here. They could, kids could ride their bikes in the neighborhood. Uh, when you look at the kind of backyard, it has a small backyard. It does have power lines right behind it. So on my desirability checklist, that is something that we would you know, check off as, eh, I don't know, some people have a problem living right next to the you know, high voltage power lines. So these are, I don't think these are high voltage ones, but still a, maybe a concern. So I would add this to my checklist. And the thing I look at, if there's three, four, five or more checks on this checklist, then I might be concerned and say, all right, that's, that's something I want to push back on. Maybe I'd look at another property, but no property is perfect. You're always going to have a couple of things on here. And so you just have to have trade-offs. You need to have some really good things that people want to trade off with the things that are not so good. And that's just, that's life. That's the way houses work. But you want to know those things ahead of time and decide, is this a green light? Am I good with this property qualitatively with my checklist, with looking at the Google street views? If it is, you say, let's move on. Let's go to the next step and let's start running the numbers. Okay, remember what we're doing here. We're analyzing this property using three ingredients, the location, the property itself, both the building and the lot. So far, we have green lights on those two things. So we're going to start looking at the numbers. And I'm going to do two different ways of analyzing the numbers, both a quick and dirty back of the envelope type analysis. And then I'm going to get into a spreadsheet. But before I do that, I want to remind you, how do you actually make money in real estate investing? Because really what running the numbers is, is telling you whether you think this property can make you a profit or not. Because even if the location's great, even if the property's great, that doesn't mean you can automatically make money with that property. So running the numbers and analyzing them and looking at formulas is really telling you one of two things. Because there's two ways that I've found that I've been able to make money on rental properties. Number one, I make money with income. So this sounds basic, but a rental property, the main point of that is to rent it to your tenant. And so this rent that comes in, you collect the rent, you pay your expenses, maybe you pay your mortgage payment, but what's left over is a cash flow. And so that cash flow is really the engine, the driver, the kind of core driver of making money with real estate investing, but it's not the only way. And sometimes it's not the biggest way to make money. The second way you make money is through something called equity growth. So this is the price of the property going up in value over time. Are you forcing the price of the property up by fixing it up or doing something to it? And also by paying your debt down on the property. So this is gap between what the property is worth and what you owe on the property, which is called your equity. And if you can turn that equity from a small amount of equity up front into a much larger amount of equity later on, you can then turn that equity into cash flow or other forms of wealth and use that by selling it, by refinancing it to help you achieve financial freedom to do all the things you want to do. So those two ways, income and equity growth, are what we want to measure when we're doing both a back of the envelope analysis and using our spreadsheets. So to start running the numbers with a back of the envelope or a quick and dirty analysis for this property, let's go back to the original Zillow listing. And there were a couple things that jumped out at me right away. One about the price and one about the rent or the income for the property. The price that it ultimately sold for was 150400 but what's interesting to look at is this was a lead, an active lead. Somebody had it on the market and it's already sold now. But at that time, it was listed two months before that in June of 2023, starting at 225000 Now, that number seems reasonable in this neighborhood. This estimate that uh, Zillow thinks is approximately worth is 235000 So not unreasonable, right? All those estimates can be inflated sometimes. You have to go and do your own analysis. We're just going to go with that number for now. And so they listed it at 225, but they quickly, within a couple of weeks, dropped it to 210. Must not have had a lot of interest on it, not enough offers. They dropped it again to 195 another week after that. So they look a little bit more motivated, right? Either they've overpriced it or they're motivated just to sell this property. And so then they got it under contract at 195, but it fell out of contract. Either somebody had an inspection and found something they didn't like or they couldn't qualify for financing. But whatever happened, it came back on the market a couple of weeks after that. And so they were even more motivated. They dropped the price to 175 less than a week later. And ultimately somebody bought it after that. So once it dropped to 175, they offered 150,400 and got the deal. So all of that to be said, when you're doing a quick analysis, if you can see that the seller seems more motivated because of the dropping of prices, or maybe you talk directly to a seller, they just have a situation where they're like, we just want to sell it quickly. We're not trying to get top dollar. That is a benefit to you because remember, you're making money in one of two ways, the income, which we're about to talk about, but also the price. And if you can go in buying a property at less than its full value, maybe 10%, 20%, even 30% below the full value of the property, you 
you've given yourself a head start on making a profit, making equity in that property. So back at the Zillow listing, the other thing that jumped out at me was the rent estimate that Zillow had of $1,552, which on the surface looks interesting, right? They bought it for $150,000, the rent's $1,550. If you've ever heard of the 1% rule in real estate, that's around the 1% rule. So that seems like a positive. But the thing is, I know this neighborhood and this area pretty well, and I was a little suspicious that that rent was actually $1,550 because of other properties I've seen. So I wanna dig a little bit more, not just take an estimate and, and what they say, it is. And so I looked at another website called Bigger Pockets. And Bigger Pockets is a real estate investing website. They actually published my book, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. But they have this free tool, which I'll put a link to in the podcast and video description as well, where they give you a list of other rentals around there, what they've rented for. So not just the ones that are currently on the market, but properties that nearby have rented six months ago or 12 months ago. And as I looked at the map of this area, I found one that was right next door to our property. So the property we're looking at right next door to it, it, it rented for $1,000 $375 not too long ago, like around the same time this property was on the market or a little bit afterwards. And this property was actually bigger than our property. So this was five bedrooms, two baths, 1,848 square feet. Ours is 1,200 square feet and it's three bedroom, two bath. But if you look at the map, I'm gonna go back to the map on Google Maps, they're right next to each other. So you can kind of look and see, this is 10 years ago, but you know, very similar type of location, lot, location. So if location is most important, a tenant, if they liked that house next door, they'll also like ours. But I'm guessing that we're not gonna be able to get quite as much rent as they are, at least when I'm analyzing it. You wanna be conservative at this stage. So after this very quick analysis, what I'm gonna tell myself is that I'm not gonna be able to get 1375. Let's just guess that I could get 1,300 per month just to see what the numbers look like with that rent. And just as an aside, before I actually spend money on a property, I wanna go in and get another opinion about the rent for the property, which usually for me means going to my property manager. If they have hundreds or thousands of units that they're renting nearby there, they're gonna have the best idea of what a property will actually rent for because they're in the trenches doing that. So that's why one of my top team members is calling my property manager, sending them a text saying, hey, I'm looking at this property. What do you think the range of what this property would rent for? And they'll give you a much more confident answer than you can do on your own. But for now, if you're just doing a quick and dirty analysis, this can be good enough. Now that I know the approximate rent for the property, I can do a quick and dirty analysis of two formulas, which for me are the most important metrics to know if this is actually a good deal or if it's not. Those two formulas are the net operating income, also known as an NOI, and then an unleveraged yield, which is very similar to another term you might have heard of called a cap rate. And what I'm trying to do here is actually something I observed with Warren Buffett when he's buying big businesses or companies or stocks. He always says, if you need a calculator or a fancy spreadsheet to know whether it's a good deal, then it's probably not a good enough deal. So this is my way of measuring approximately the income of the property to see how good of a job it does at that, to see whether this return on investment, whether the profitability of this property is worth pursuing and digging into more with a spreadsheet and taking a lot more time. So for the net operating income, you wanna start with the rent, which we just figured out is 1,300 per month. And for this very quick and dirty analysis, I'm just gonna assume that half of my rent is gone to operating expenses. So operating expenses are things like taxes, insurance, maintenance, paying a property manager, maybe allocating a little bit of money for vacancy and also replacing big items like capital expenses for your roof, for your heating and air, things like that. We're going to get into more detail on what those actually might be, but just rough numbers, I'm going to say 50%. This is probably a little conservative for me. Most of my properties have about a 40 to 45% expense ratio, but at this point, it's okay to be conservative. Remember, rough numbers, it should still jump off the page. So when we take away half of 1300, we get $650 per month is our net operating income. This is the amount of money you would make if you didn't have a mortgage on the property because we're not including a mortgage expense yet. We're assuming that we just pay cash for this property. Now, of course, we probably will get a mortgage or we'll get financing on it, but we're trying to judge the merit of this property by itself without all the complications of financing. So that $650 times 12, if you wanna get an annual number, is $7,800 per year. So that's one thing that we want to know, the net operating income, but we also want to know a return on investment. How much money are we going to get back each year as a percentage of what we actually invested in it? And that's what an unleveraged yield could tell us. So 7,800 is a net operating income, and we divide that by our total cost in the property, the total purchase price plus any other costs we have. And I just approximated that number really quickly again. We are assuming we're gonna pay 150,500, which was the price somebody paid for this property. And then I'm just gonna round up and say another $10,000 in closing costs, maybe three or 4,000 for that, and maybe six or 7,000 for some repairs. I've very rarely bought a property that's truly turnkey. There's always something to do to it. So that's just a minimal amount of money that you would spend. 
So 10,000 bucks makes that $160,500 is our total cost in the property. So the unleveraged yield just says, if we're gonna make 7,800 in income for the year, divide that by our total cost of 160,500, and we get an unleveraged yield or return on investment from the income of the property of 4.9%, around 5%. Now I'll cut to the chase. Everybody's gonna have different ideas of what's a good deal and what's not. For me in this neighborhood, in this market, at this time, getting a 5% cash return is not actually a good enough return. I'm probably gonna be in the area of about 6% would be a cutoff point for me on this property. But let me show you why. What's the logic behind that for me and what my big term goal is for this property? Remember when I talked about how you make profit on a property, you make it in two ways. Number one, you make it with income. Number two, you make it with the growth of the property. So when I look at this, this measurement of the internal rate of return is just one way of me making a profit. So if I make a 5% return, and let's say my total goal for this entire property without leverage before I start taking into account debt and mortgages and all that, is I wanna make about a 10% return. Well, if I make 5% from the income, which is what we just figured out, and if I assume, and I've done my homework on this property, I gotta make some kind of assumption about what kind of growth rate I'm gonna have for the future. Let's just assume that in my market, I'm gonna make a three to 4% return. Now, that could be wrong. We could have a 0% return for a while. We could have a 10% return. And one way I did that was go into a website like neighborhoodscout.com, and there's others out there where you can actually look at what the appreciation rate is historically for certain neighborhoods. And so I looked at Central South Carolina, and if you went back over the last few years, it's actually been very high. Uh, in the last quarter, it was 9.47%. The last 12 months, 7% appreciation. The last two years, almost 14%. And the last five years, 10%. That's historically very, very high. I don't wanna use that, I don't wanna project that number into the future. Since 2000, it's been about 4%, which is even above the rest of my area. So this is a good market to invest in, but this leads me just to a guess. I'm not gonna say that's gonna happen or not gonna happen, but when I go back to my own analysis and say, what is this actually gonna be? I'm just gonna guess three to 4%. And so back to whether, how much I can pay for this property, that means if I have 5% return from the income, three to 4% from the growth of the property, I would project about an eight to 9% return. And I'm shooting for at least a 10% conservative number with no debt and this is just not cutting it. So the question would be, how can I actually make a 10%? So I'm here on the back of my envelope, scratching this out saying, all right, if 150,000 doesn't do it for me, what would do it? And that's actually just pretty simple math. I would take the same net operating income because that's the fact, that's the, that's the reality of the market. I'm gonna rent it and have those expenses approximately. But if I wanted to make a 6% unleveraged yield instead of a 5%, I would just divide 7,800 divided by 6%, gives me 130,000 total cost but remember I had another $10,000 in repairs and closing costs like that. So I need to subtract 10,000 from 130 to get my purchase price, which would be at approximately $120,000. So at this point in the analysis, I've just done this back of the envelope analysis and said, you know what? This is approximately what the rent is. This is approximately what the return is. For me to get my 10% return that I'm personally shooting for in this market, I probably couldn't pay 150,000 bucks. I'm just keeping that in my head. I'm not done with the analysis yet because maybe I missed something. Maybe there's a whole lot of uh, value in this property. Maybe it's worth 250, 300,000 bucks and I can make my return in another way. But at least for now, I'm getting a little skeptical and saying, all right, I need to probably negotiate. I might need to make an offer on this property or maybe, maybe just walk away because it's not meeting my criteria yet. You know, many times as an investor, it's easy to get stuck at the stage of the analysis. We found a location we liked, we found a property we liked, those are two ingredients, but then we got to the numbers, those pesky numbers, and it just doesn't seem to make sense. You know, the price that we can pay is a lot lower than what we could likely get the property for, and so the impulse is just to give up on the deal, and it may be ultimately that we do need to pass on this deal and move on to some other deals, but I don't wanna give up on it yet, and I wanna pull out another tool. This is a good time for your spreadsheet, because many times the reason a deal doesn't work is because of the financing, is because of the price. And so what I wanna do now is show you how a spreadsheet can be a really good tool to quickly analyze what numbers would work if we were to buy this property. Because many times when you're negotiating with a seller, when you're looking at a property, you can make an offer. Even if they reject it initially, maybe they'll come back to it later. Or if you're talking directly to the seller, one of my favorite things to do is make give them multiple offers. One offer where I pay cash for it, another offer with seller financing. And so I wanna show you a little bit of that behind the scenes with a spreadsheet on how you can use this tool to do the same thing. 
So this is a simple rental property spreadsheet, which you can actually get for free. Just look for a link below in the podcast or the video description. Now I'm gonna quickly show you how it works and give you a few scenarios, but my first tip is to only change the numbers in red and leave everything else alone. Unless you're a spreadsheet nerd and you like going under the hood and changing these kind of things, that'll make it work the best. So the first scenario I wanna go into with a spreadsheet is just the existing price that we've been working on, 150,400. And I'm also gonna assume we go out to the bank and get a conventional 30 year investor type loan. And my goal is just to make this property have a, at least a break even or a positive cash flow. And I wanna see what we have to do to make that work. So right here in this first cell, we put the purchase price of 150,400. Remember, we also add the $6,000 in repairs and $4,000 in closing costs for a total of 10,000 extra dollars. That's 160,400 is our total cost. And then in this cell, we have our rent that we estimated of 1,300. Now, if you're using this spreadsheet to analyze a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex, there's room for you to put the rent of the other units as well. But in this case, we just have a single family house, so we're gonna leave that at 1,300. Then there's also a place here for vacancy rate, which just means that you're not gonna be renting this property 100% of the time and collecting rent 100% of the time. Every once in a while, a tenant will move out. And then you'll have a month in between tenants. So I just put a 5% vacancy rate, which is approximately one month out of every two years. And then we get to the financing part. And one of the good things about a spreadsheet is you can plug in the numbers and it'll tell you what your financing payment's gonna be. And just for now, because a lot of the deals these days with higher interest rates, you have to put a little bit more money down to make it cash flow. I started with a 40% down payment, which means I'd finance about $90,000. And I'd also make a down payment of $60,000. So with a 7.5% interest rate and on a 30 year loan, that means I'd have a payment of $631 per month in principal and interest. What's also interesting about the spreadsheet is it'll tell you your budget for how much cash you're gonna have to spend on this deal. So when you total up the down payment of 60,160 plus the $10,000 in other cash costs we talked about. So in this scenario, you'd have about $70,000 that you would need to come up with. So this is a good thing to know if you're trying to plan for your savings or if you need to bring in a partner or find other sources of funds. And then finally at the top here, I wanna put in our assumption of what the full price of this property is. And this is a whole nother topic. You could get a realtor to help you out in figuring out the value of it. And I've also thought about doing a video on this in the future on how to run comps and how to estimate your own value. So let me know in the comments below if that's something you want me to do. But for now, behind the scenes, I ran the numbers here and the estimate was about 235,000. But after looking at comps and looking at the local market, my guesstimate was it was between 190 and $200,000. So I just estimated 195 as the full value. And then I also put a 3% appreciation rate, which I'll show you where that comes into play here in a second. But we talked about that in the back of the envelope analysis as well. So one of the helpful things about a spreadsheet is you can actually dig in on some of the actual operating expenses. Instead of just estimating that there's 50% of the rent is gone to all these expenses, you actually get into each one, one by one. So for example, property taxes, you can look up specifically how much you're gonna to have to pay on this property. But this is one of those you wanna be careful on because I looked on this property, for example, and last year the property taxes were $560 or so. But when you estimate what will actually happen when you buy the property, perhaps the value will go up to the price you paid or to a current market value. And then also in many states, including South Carolina where I am, owner occupants pay a lot lower tax rates or a lot lower tax bills than an investor would. And so the actual tax bill when I ran with a calculator in my local county was about 2240 instead of $560. So you want to run those numbers. You want to look at your local tax treasurer, tax assessor to figure out how to actually calculate the taxes in your area. And then you can plug it into your spreadsheet. I also looked up the insurance, which I have a lot of comparable properties that I can use, but you can also get an insurance agent or investor friends and just ask them what they pay for it. Or you can even just Google it. What's a typical landlord insurance rate for for a property in this area. Be sure to ask for landlord insurance and not just owner occupant insurance. And then you get to things like maintenance and capital expenses, which is another bigger topic, but I found people chronically underestimate how much maintenance and how much capital expenses they're gonna have to pay. So I typically use a number in my own properties of about 15% between those two categories. I've just looked at all of my properties over a long period of time and about 15% of the rent has been the average of what I pay in maintenance and capital expenses. So here I just divided it between seven and a half percent for maintenance and repairs, which is like turnover expenses, painting, little plumbing leaks, things like that. And then capital expenses are setting aside money to replace heating and air units, the driveway, a roof if you have to replace that. So these are bigger expenses that don't come as often, but when they do come, they're very expensive. So you wanna allocate money for both of those. And then I set aside some money, of course, here for property management. Even if you're managing it yourself, I recommend you put eight, 10%, whatever the market rate is in your area, because if not, you are managing this property for free. 
great. And if you want to do what I've done and go travel to Spain or have some freedom and flexibility in your life and only work a little bit on your properties, you want to be able to pay a property manager or you want to be able to find properties that have tenants who are pretty self-sufficient and they can manage themselves. There's different approaches to that. But I do recommend building in a property management fee just in case so you can pay someone else to do it. So in this scenario, I add all of those up and I get about a 51% expense ratio. So the total expenses were 7,162 per year. So if you remember, I ran the back of the envelope numbers and I guessed, hey, maybe it's about 50% and I thought it'd be a little conservative, but in this case, it's actually a little bit more expensive even than my estimate. So every property is a little different, but this seems to be about accurate in this case. But the moment of truth in any spreadsheet is when you get to the bottom of the spreadsheet, when you have the actual numbers that you're using to analyze whether this is a good deal. And in this case, we barely have a positive cash flow. So if positive cash flow were a big, important part of a good deal for you, this one makes about $7 a month in this scenario, or $86 per year. I'm going to give you a couple ideas on how we might be able to change that. But for now, that's something good to know. And of course, your cash on cash return, you spent $70,000 to do this deal, to buy it, and you have about a 0.12% cash on cash return. You make a little bit of money from the amortization of the property, paying the loan down. In this case, it's only about $890 per year right now. So really the bulk of your growth, your return, if you have some at this price, would be in the growth of the property, the price of the property, and then also eventually the rent growing over time. And so in this spreadsheet, we've just calculated that as $5,850 in year number one, and that's just 3% of the full price of the property. Now, one thing we don't account for in this spreadsheet is that we're, if we buy this property below the value, if we buy it for 150 and have 160,000 in it total, and if the property is worth 190, 195, maybe we could sell the property and make some profit there. And we have some equity because we've bought it below value. So that is a value and you need to use a different kind of spreadsheet, like an internal rate of return, uh, which is a whole nother topic. And I have a video on that as well. And it's probably my most thorough way of analyzing a deal. In this case, I'm trying to keep it a little bit simpler. But you can check out the video with a link above and also in the video description where you can see how I run the numbers with an internal rate of return and also get a free copy of my spreadsheet. But back to our deal, when you combine all of this, the point is that for the $70,000 I invest in this deal, with the growth of the property, I'd make a just under a 10% return. Now compare this to my other 10%. When I did the back of the envelope analysis, that was in a very conservative scenario where I had no financing on the property and I was willing to make about a 10% return between the income and the growth on the property. But these are not comparing apples with apples. When you have leverage on the property, when you're taking the risk of borrowing money, I typically want to make a much higher return in that case. Usually for me, it's a minimum 15%, usually above 20% return. And in this case, it's just not real impressive. So the deal as it sits right now isn't something that I'm excited about unless I make some changes. So one of the things you can change to make a deal better or worse is the price you pay for the property. And a spreadsheet's a really good way just to play with different prices to see whether you like it at one price or whether you don't like it at another price. So I've plugged in $120,000, which was an estimate of what I thought would be a good deal when I did the back of the envelope analysis. As you can see here, I haven't changed anything else just the price. We've kept the type of financing the same, 40% down, 7.5% loan for 30 years, but it has changed the amount of financing we get because if we pay a lower price, we borrow less money. We have $72,000 in financing instead of about 90,000, which means we have about a $500 payment instead of over $600. So with just that change, we're going to change the amount of cash flow. We're going to change what are, we invest in the property as well. Because remember, if we put less money down because we paid a lower price, then we have about $58,000 total investment instead of the $70,000 we had before. So changing the price changes your down payment, changes the financing. We didn't change anything about the operating expenses, but when you look at the bottom, we're now making $135 per month in cash flow or $1,600 per year. Still not something you're gonna get wealthy off of, but to start with a positive cash flow to have a margin of safety is a better place to go. Investors call properties with negative cash flow from the very beginning alligators. And there are some cases where maybe you have a lot of upside on the property where it might make sense if you have deep pockets to fund a little bit of negative cash flow, but in general, starting with positive cash flow is the way you wanna go. So by paying $120,000 in this case, we're able to have positive cash flow. We're still amortizing the loan a little bit, and we're still having the same amount of growth, price appreciation that we had before, 3%, of 195,000, but because we invested less money, if you look at the total return on investment between these three sources, the cash flow, the amortization of the loan, and the growth of the property, we have a 14% return on our invested cash instead of the nine or nine and a half percent or 10% that we had before. So in my world, this is really how it works. You set a goal on what you want to have as a return on investment. You set a goal on the type of property, the buy box that you want to buy a property in, and then you decide what's the price I can pay. And you make an offer. 
And many times you get rejected. And so the likelihood that we can get this offer accepted at $120,000, well below what they were asking, is probably pretty low. But if you make enough offers, if you talk to enough people, if you make the case, there might be certain properties where your numbers make sense and are close to what the seller is willing to do, but you don't know until you make the offer. Now, price is one thing we can change. We can make a lower offer, but there's also something else that a lot of people don't think about, that if you like the property, if you like the location, and you think it's going to be a good investment over a long period of time, the most important variable is actually the financing and not just the price. So I want to show you how you can use the spreadsheet to maybe make a second offer, or if you're negotiating directly with a seller, to make a higher offer in some cases, where you can be a little bit more aggressive on price, but still make this a good investment for you. So I've just played with the numbers. Remember this listing price was 175,000 and then somebody ended up buying for 150,000 bucks. But what if we were negotiating with a seller and we found out that they own this property free and clear and that maybe they were a retiring landlord and they just didn't want to manage this property anymore and they might be open to receiving payments over time. So what if I made them an offer of 175,000, the price they were asking for it. We still have our $10,000 in costs, the 6,000 in repairs and 4,000 in closing costs for a total of 185,000. So we're pretty close to what the full value of the property is. We get a little bit of a discount, but we're not getting a huge discount on the price. And then everything else is the same. The rent's the same, the expenses are the same. But what we do is we offer them owner financing with terms that are more attractive for us. So we make a 20% down payment, which is still pretty reasonable compared to a conventional loan. But then we ask them to give us a 3% interest rate for 30 years on the seller financing. So that's the variable that we're changing to make this deal better for us. There's an old maxim in real estate investing that you need to buy low and sell high. And that's always true. If you can buy low, that's great. But you can also make money by buying quality properties and borrowing low and renting high. And this is what a lot of us got used to over the years with conventional loans over the last five, six, seven years, you could get for three, four or 5%. But right now they're not that low and who knows when they'll come back. But if you're negotiating directly with a seller and they're motivated to sell their property, sometimes you can get a much better deal than you could get at a bank. So let's just say they would finance it to us at 3% for 30 years. That'd be a $590 payment. And let's just look at what that does for us as an investor on our return. Number one, we'd have about a $50 per month cash flow, $578 per year. That's not anything to write home about, not great, but it is a positive cash flow. So if our goal is just to hold on to this property and then let the rents go up over time, it's a better start than we had buying it at a lower price with a higher interest rate. We're getting to pay the loan down a little bit, so that's helping us out a little bit. And then we're also still getting the growth of the property over time. But the bottom line is, is that we had less money that we invested in the property. So $45,000 instead of the $70,000 we put down before just to get a positive cash flow. And so our return on investment is about 20%. So we've paid a higher price, we've got a lower interest rate, and we've doubled our return on investment. And the name of the game in investing is taking a certain amount of money you have today, investing in something, almost like planting a seed with a fruit tree, and then growing that investment over time. And if that's what our goal is, and if this is a quality property that we can hold for a 5, 10, 15 year period, you can still turn a property like this into a very good investment, even paying a higher price because of getting good terms. So really the big takeaway of this video is that there's a process and there are tools that you can use to analyze a rental property. So don't forget about all the tools I've covered in this video from the deal analysis worksheet where you have the desirability checklist to all the different spreadsheets I have. You can get those for free at the links below in the podcast description. But really the takeaway from this video that I want you to leave with is that confidence is a currency. That the more you know how to analyze deals, the more you practice it, the more you learn about it, the more confident you'll get that you can go out and buy properties and make offers to people that make sense for you. And one of the things that will increase your confidence, everything we've covered in this video has been projecting for the future, looking at a property that you might buy. But what's very helpful is actually looking at properties that someone has already bought and looking what the numbers actually were, not just what you projected them to be. So the next video I wanna share with with you is actually the very first rental property I bought where I went back and I looked over the last 17 years what were the numbers on that rental property and I think you'll find that helpful if you want to analyze your own deals looking at the numbers and how they actually worked for me on a single family house that was my very first rental you can check out that video above me here and there'll also be a link below in the video description